very warm welcome to COVID-19 Updates from Singapore. My name is Caitlin Wee and I'm a third year medical student at NUS Yong Lu Lin School of Medicine. This is a series of webinars presented by NUS Yong Lu Lin School of Medicine, National University Health System and Global Outbreak Alert and Response Network. The COVID-19 Updates from Singapore weekly webinar series will provide viewpoints and insights from a panel of leading experts in infectious diseases and related specialties and disciplines. It is now my pleasure to introduce you to our moderator, who is also the program director of the series. Recruited to establish an infectious disease training program in Singapore, he was the first infectious diseases head of department in the Communicable Disease Centre here in 1992. He is currently Associate Vice President of Health Innovation and Transformation, National University of Singapore. Ladies and gentlemen, Associate Professor David Allen. Thank you, Caitlin. Good evening and welcome to all who are joining us. We appreciate your interest in COVID-19 and your support of our efforts to share what is known about it with you. We hope this broadcast finds you safe and acclimating to the new world in which we live. The topic for tonight's episode is Current Global Efforts on COVID-19 Research and Development. Our guest this week to help address that topic is Peter, uh, Professor Peter Piott, who will, I will formally introduce uh, to you after Dale's epidemiology update. Our usual format is modified this week. Dale will start off with an update of regional and international COVID-19 epidemiology. Following that, I'll have a question and answer session with Professor Piott on this evening's topic. Please send in your questions. Uh, Peter doesn't shy away from hard questions, and we'll try to get to as many of those questions as we can this evening. After the question and answer period, they will provide a weekly uh, review of current events of interest, following which I'll summarize tonight's key points, provide a preview of next week's guest expert, and reveal the mystery pandemic song of the week. Please send in your questions along with the country where you are watching. It now gives me great pleasure to introduce Dale Fisher, Professor of Medicine, National University of Singapore, Young Lu Lin School of Medicine, Senior Consultant, Division of Infectious Disease, National University Hospital, and Chair of the Global Outbreak Alert and Response Network, hosted by World Health Organization. Dale, over to you. Thanks, David. Great, so um, pretty conventional approach to the EPI updates this week. Uh, you can see that over the last uh, week from the 25th of June to today, which is the 2nd of July, that uh, the number of cases has gone up um, uh, 
as as expected in the order of what about uh, one one point three million. So you remember over the last weeks we've what we've been watching that number uh, climb each week. Uh, for those who are obsessed by number of cases, and as you know, uh, many of us are going off case count as being a particularly relevant metric. What's not what is relevant though is the number of deaths, and that's uh, around. Uh, What's that? Uh, about thirty-four thousand a, a, a day at the moment. <clears throat> Sorry, a week. So um, let's uh, let's get into it. You can see there's the number of cases uh, again, as last week, largely driven by by the Americas uh, and to a lesser extent by the by the Indian subcontinent. Uh, number of deaths is probably tick, ticking up a little bit. So so we're seeing around five thousand deaths a day. Uh, and, uh, and and these number of cases uh, each each day, um, bre uh, breaking it down a little bit by by WHO region, uh, you can see Africa continues to climb, although the the death rate staying quite low, still around 200, at least 200 recognised uh, per day. Um, Eastern Mediterranean uh, kicking up. Europe, as we know, coming down, but 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 flattening out, but the, the death rate coming down. The Americas still in, in uh, sh showing showing significantly increased growth, as as is the Southeast Asian region. Uh, Wipro being the 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 area with the the I guess best control with uh, with around 2,000 cases a day and and just 100 or so deaths. Um, we're going to look through the. The countries a bit more this time. So, so let's start with talking about China. Uh, you'll remember um, uh, I described these uh, Zinfadi uh, markets uh, a couple of weeks ago. That was uh, uh, June 11. That that outbreak was first uh, noted. Now, since since then, it's gone to to about 350 cases related to that. Um, so that was just over two weeks ago. So now they're into the the second round of testing, uh, obviously one test not being enough to, to shut down an outbreak. So they're doing uh, second swabs and, and many people, because they're obviously all not isolated, uh, especially some directly related to the market are, are going to, to remain on, on quarantine for another 14 days and then have a third swab. So it'll be a little while before they, they, they declare that outbreak over. Um, millions of swabs. Um, all the surrounding residents, uh, about 1.2 million food workers, whether it's uh, food and beverage, delivery, or, or directly related to the markets, uh, are, are all included. Um, still not clear how this outbreak started. Uh, it smells a little bit like, like Wuhan, of course. It, uh, that doesn't mean that the outbreak started there, but uh, it's certainly been, been amplified there. Whether it was a food import, import which is being looked at, uh, whether there's been silent transmission happening for some 55 days, which I think most of us feel is less likely, or, or whether it's uh, a lot of the cases in China are actually imported cases. So, so maybe it was a false negative imported case. Um, there was some description today that perhaps uh, the strain looks like um, w one that's more likely to have come from, from Asia. So maybe it was a, a, a traveler that went in there. This is another outbreak that, that's happened, this uh, Anjin County. Uh, for everything over the next five minutes while I talk, I'll apologize in advance for all my pronunciations, but uh, they found 18 cases here. So it's not directly related to the market. It's about an hour or two drive away, but uh, it being down here south, but, but as a result of these 18 cases that have been found, they've uh, done a lockdown there of, uh, of around 400,000 people. And that's going to be one of the themes of, uh, of my EPI report today is this selective lockdown that we're seeing at, at various places around the world. Japan, you can see there's a little, a little spike happening here. So, so that's probably a, a lot of it seems to be related to a Tokyo nightclub district. And, and today they had over 100 cases for the first time uh, in a little while. Um, Singapore will come back to. Korea's got this nice flat curve of 50 or 60 cases a day, which I've, I've said before, I think it's it's quite nice. It's really living with the virus, and as long as it's not taking off, then then that's uh, then that's a, a good thing. It's uh, related to offices, and as as people might transmit in an office, um, then they'll go and and maybe um, 
uh, cause a cluster in a religious gathering or, or family cluster. So, so that's what's happening in, in Korea at the moment. A lot of, lot of talk in Australia and, and New Zealand. So in, in Australia, in, in Melbourne, which is in Victoria, um, this is what, what Melbourne uh, looks like. And they've shut down these, these 10 postcodes. All these suburbs are, are in, in lockdown, which is uh, obviously very disappointing because they've only recently come out of lockdown uh, across the whole of Australia. There's around 300 cases. They've done, um, done uh, about 113,000 tests. They're doing a lot of door knocking, 50, 54,000 doors they've knocked on as of today, I read. Uh, and they've declared these four reasons to leave home. If you live in one of these suburbs, you, you can only leave if it's for food or, or, or supplies, care, care or being cared for, exercise, and, and work, work and education. So obviously you just, you're not allowed out for any leisure activities. You, you stay in your, in your doors. And I think that's, uh, I think I saw it was till July 29. So, so, so this is uh, pretty harsh. The, the very unusual sight for Australia to see police walking around the streets of suburbs asking where people are going and why, but, but that's the, the, the promise that's been made. So, and you can see from this epi curve of Victoria how how it, uh, uh, the, the original shutdown, which was national, uh, a rumbling of cases, and now this, this takeoff in those suburbs in Melbourne. Um, New Zealand, on the other hand, is, uh, uh, remains at, at, at zero, uh, effectively. These are, these are all imported cases. So um, I'm gonna come back uh, in, in my later segment to talk about what, what the implications of zero cases and, and actually I'm, I'm going to be advocating that zero is probably not a good number. Um, across the Southeast Asian region, obviously India continuing to, to drive it. We're seeing more of these spikes in deaths which represent catch up reporting. Um, Bangladesh, um, uh, in, in Indonesia is, um, that they've just stopped easing their, uh, the, it doesn't really look like there's been a lot of social restrictions, but anyway, they've stopped easing. Uh, closing schools uh, and really trying to ramp up the community efforts, which are particularly mask wearing, hand hygiene and social distancing, which really aren't catching on in Indonesia yet. But uh, anyway, they're not locking back down, but they're stopping all their, all their easings. Uh, here's another, uh, s s these spikes where people do the catch up reporting. I can't help but wonder if, uh, if there's got to be a catch up here, it just, uh, it, it it doesn't, it doesn't look right to me, but uh, I guess we'll, we'll see one day. Um, Italy, I, I've put a map, map of Italy here. Most of the cases remain up here. There's, I think, 62 reported there yesterday. So this is Milan, Lombardy, this, this, this province here. Um, but there's a few more cases coming out of the south now. So this um, uh, and uh, has uh, this Campania, which is where, where Naples is the is the capital is a is a bit of a uh, uh, increasing hotspot. Um, Germany uh, has also got a bit of bit of talk about it. They've gone back into lockdown in uh, in in this area um, called Gütersloh, um, which is uh, a, an, an abattoir. There's about six hundred thousand people in this region that have gone back into lockdown. Uh, a lot of cases of the seven thousand. People in this uh, in this abattoir, fifteen hundred of them uh, are cases. So we've we've heard this a lot from uh, from meatpacking factories and abattoirs and things like that. And there's a little bit of writing going around at the moment that why are these places so so susceptible? And it really, uh, I'll declare my 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 lack of my ignorance here because I've never been inside one. But uh, the pictures certainly show that they're crowded. These people work elbow to elbow. Um, there's poor ventilation. They're cooled naturally somewhere between like four, four degrees, which is a fridge and up to 12 degrees, but obviously to preserve the food, they remain cooled. There's metal services. So a cool metal service is, is very friendly to environmental contamination and survival. They're dark and we know UV light uh, kills the virus. So, so being dark would support it. Being noisy, apparently they're very noisy. So people might have to go and if they want to talk with someone, they have, might have to pull down the mask and yell at them. So we know that's uh, that's uh, 
that's a potential risk. Of course, in Singapore, you're not allowed to talk on the, on the MRT, the underground train. So the demographics as well, because of the, the, the social situation of these people, they might have to, to, the workers have to go to work when they're sick, um, that might have been a problem. Uh, crowded buses, the traveling, and also crowded housing. So, so it's a bad, so it's a, it's a, it's a perfect storm uh, virtually for, for viral transmission. And I think that's why we see it in, uh, across the world really. So just uh, moving on to, to uh, other areas, again, you can see Sweden's about three and a half thousand deaths now. Um, and you can see many of these countries, are, uh, uh, other countries uh, are bringing their numbers down. Uh, the rest of uh, Scandinavia as well, uh, Denmark, Norway, Finland, all, all, all coming down. And we saw that in the, in the, in the bigger epi curve of, of the region. Uh, moving into the, to, to the Middle East, um, you can see that, uh, that uh, I Iran has got this very nice looking second wave and now with, a, with about 150 deaths a day. Um, and, and this is clearly due to, to premature lifting of, of all their restrictions. Um, there's, uh, they're having trouble with, with the community engagement, the mask wearing, the social distancing, um, because when they undid all these restrictions, it, it is said there was a perception that it wasn't needed anymore. So, so this is part of the reason why there's a, a repeat effort going on there. Um, Iraq, on, on the other hand, is quite different. For the last month, we've seen numbers uh, really cr climb there. Um, perhaps it was the end of Ramadan in, in late May, um, but they're getting close to having their hospitals overwhelmed. They've got about 500 ventilators, ventilator beds in the country. So, so you can see that uh, with 100 deaths a day, those, uh, those are probably pretty close to all being used. They've got, and, and like much of the Middle East, there's problems with, with PPE. So uh, I, I don't really know how, um, how this one's gonna go. I think it'll be quite challenging. So we know the United States, uh, that's had a spike. I heard today it was 50,000 uh, uh, cases in a day. Um, and obviously around a thousand deaths a day. So that's uh, in, in all, all but a handful of states. Um, uh, I think there's probably not, uh, not much other, other news in, in, in uh, those countries, except to say you can see there's some very familiar patterns with, with increase in cases and deaths really across that, uh, that continent. Uh, Africa, of course, we've got Chikwe coming on in a, in a couple of weeks, I think, to, to talk about the, the Nigerian and African situation. They've got uh, some more isolation facilities. Uh, they're easing some things. They're easing their curfews. Uh, they did have a curfew from 10 p.m. to 4 a.m. Uh, they've got some more isolation facilities, but they're probably going to start permitting mild cases to be isolated at home. So just a, a little bit of a bit of a change there, but uh, I'm looking forward to hearing more about that. So let's go to Singapore. Um, the uh, Apple mobility trends, you can see uh, that here's February, March, April. So we're pretty pretty much back there. And I think that's, that's what we're mostly seeing uh, for those of us living in Singapore, that, uh, that the people movement is uh, pretty much sadly pretty close back to, to where it was at the beginning of the outbreak. So, so that's uh, probably not so, so ideal, although there's many social restrictions and mask wearing that, that are in place. These are our three epi curves. Um, again, imported cases not being so, so frequent. Uh, the, the number of cases in the dormitories coming down, but, but with, a, with a, a stubborn tail that we expected. And these are the cases uh, uh, in, in the community. Um, so, so quite, quite low sing single digits, mostly. These are community linked versus unlinked. So, so quite a few unlinked cases, but remember these are unlinked before investigation. And, and we know many of these end up linked to other clusters and nonetheless, they're still less than 10. So, so I think um, uh, we'll, we, we wait and see. Here's the state of play in Singapore at the moment. We have one person in the IC, in ICU in the country. Uh, we have 208 in the general hospitals, just under 5,000 now in, in isolation facilities, and there's been, been 26 deaths.
So that's uh, all I've got for you this week, David. Back to you. Thanks. Thank you, Dale. I appreciate uh, the, the the facts, but I'm not sure I'm terribly encouraged. Uh, nevertheless, um, just want to remind uh, our, our viewers, we don't have many questions yet for uh, Prof Piat. Uh, please, uh, please uh, send those in. Remember to send your questions in the country where you're watching uh, via the Q&A tool at the bottom of your Zoom screen. It gives me great pleasure to introduce our guest expert, uh, Baron Peter Piat. He's director of the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, the Honda Professor of Global Health, co-discoverer of the Ebola virus in Zaire in 1976, and he's been a leading HIV investigator, in numerous leadership positions in Europe, Africa, and North America, including the founding uh, executive director of UN AIDS and associate director of the World Health Organization Global Program on AIDS. He's also a great friend of Singapore. Uh, the title of our discussion this evening will be uh, Current Global Efforts on COVID-19 Research and Development. Peter, thank you for joining us. Thank you, David. I'm glad to be back in, uh, in Singapore, although virtually I wish I were there with you. Yes, well, here. We, we look forward to your next visit. Uh, let me jump right in as uh, we do have a finite amount of time. Just uh, tell us how your current jobs, uh, and you do have multiple jobs, are relevant to COVID-19 research and development. Well, my day job is, uh, as you said, uh, I'm the director of the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And uh, the whole school is actually mobilized in, uh, you know, since basically uh, the end of January, early February, uh, to deal with COVID. And that goes from, uh, you know, about 30 mathematical modelers uh, who are, uh, you know, looking at various scenarios in the beginning with hardly any data, now better and better informed providing policy advice to the government, but also to um, many countries. Um, we, uh, we are active in terms of clinical trials. Uh, over half of our staff are based overseas, and so we're very active in, in Africa, where um, one can anticipate that, uh, as we just heard from Dale, that the, um, the spread of uh, the virus is, is just starting. Um, we are active in social sciences, uh, you had Heidi Larson on the uh, in this series, so she uh, told that story of uh, following fake news and what's going on, uh, the trust. So we are really very, very busy. And on the, on the other hand, it has an, an, an impact on, on, on how we teach. So we went digital and, uh, uh, and that happened really nearly overnight. And, uh, and the reason is that last year we, uh, we invested quite heavily in um, you know, in remote working, in uh, video conferencing, as a contribution to reduce our carbon footprint as part of, uh, you know, against climate change. And then I'm also, in my so-called free time, a uh, special advisor to um, Dr. Ursula von der Leyen, who is the president of the European Commission and special advisor on uh, R&D for, for COVID, where the EU is uh, playing quite a big role. So, and I could go on. Yeah, wow. That's, that's, we appreciate all your efforts. Um, your careers provide you experience dealing with AIDS and Ebola, amongst other outbreaks. And you've stated about these experiences uh, that uh, they, quote, changed how we view the world, end quote. Has your experience professionally and personally with COVID-19 changed how you view the world? Let's start with the professional. Um, for years, as uh, people, you know, I and a few others, uh, I've been giving speeches, including in Singapore, and the title of one of my speeches was, Are We Ready for the Next Pandemic? This is particularly when, uh, you know, we had the, the century uh, of after the Spanish flu, and the answer was no. So this uh, epidemic did not come as a surprise. It had to happen one day, uh, a respiratory virus uh, with a serious uh, mortality. Um, but I must admit that I uh, implicitly, I always thought this will probably be a kind of a new strain of, uh, of influenza. So I was wrong on that one. Um, but in any case, um, professionally, I, I was not surprised. Uh, and I was surprised that people were surprised. And I was upset that many countries uh, were not really uh, ready. And I'd always been very skeptical about these uh, um, box ticking exercises that uh, WHO and international organizations do to rank countries um, in terms of their preparedness for epidemics. And uh, both the US and the UK ranked very highly there and they have 
among the worst in the world too, in terms of uh, response. So it shows that the administrative approach in peacetime doesn't necessarily match to what, uh, you know, how you will act when there's a crisis. Um, at a personal level, yeah, I had some quite severe episode of uh, COVID-19. And um, on the one hand, it, uh, you know, first time in my life, I was uh, seriously ill and, and I thought, okay, I've been trying to make the life of, mi of viruses miserable for decades, now they got me. Uh, so I'm not invincible, and uh, uh, it was an humbling experience. Uh, but also it taught me about the uh, infection that um, COVID-19 is much more than either a bit of a flu or a serious flu, or 1% of people die. And then often, uh, at least here in the UK, uh, we say, oh, and it's older people, people over 70, I'm 71, or people with underlying conditions, as if we are not really full citizens. Um, but there's a lot in between. And in my case, it's a kind of, it took about three months uh, between onset of uh, illness and recovery, which is still not 100%. Um, and uh, so there's a lot of chronic conditions, sequelae probably also, that uh, we are going to have to deal with uh, as a result of this epidemic. And at the end of the day, probably millions of people, since we are only at the beginning, but also, um, you know, it, it gave me an insight as a patient. I've always been on the other side as a, as a physician, as a doctor. And here, suddenly, I had to be a patient. Um, but in about one minute, I became a patient. And I was not trying to second guess. Also, I was so totally exhausted and sick that I had no time to second guess what the physicians were doing. But I really appreciated that uh, you know, we have modern medicine and that I'm living in a country, uh, you know, with uh, a national health service that uh, where is no, uh, you know, access problems and, um, and that something like oxygen exists and so on. So I'm, I'm very grateful to be alive. And, uh, uh, but I think one of the main lessons for me is that you, uh, you know, I, I try to be far more um, how to say selective and, and try to deal with what's important and not to be diverted by uh, what I think are often is a lot of noise and some and that maybe uh, dominated sometimes my life too much. Well, we're very grateful you, you spared some time for us. That's, uh, we very much appreciate it. Joe, if you could put up a slide number one. Uh, and I'll let our readers uh, look at this. Uh, this was a tweet from uh, Natalie E. Dean. Um, and I think while you're reading that, I, I, I uh, wanted to uh, describe that uh, some uh, leaders have been describing COVID-19 as it being like, a, like the flu. Uh, does that make your job as an opinion leader, a policy influencer, public health institution leader easier or harder? Well, I think this is uh, fortunately less and less the case, but it made it harder. But I think also in the scientific community, we thought initially uh, that this is either like SARS or is behaving like the flu. And, and, it's, and we were also wrong collectively, less so in Singapore. I think you were much faster to, ca you know, to capture what this is. Um, but it had lots of impl implications for policy, uh, also like uh, the role of uh, school children in transmission, for example. But, um, but in terms of the... Um, you know, public awareness, this was not helpful because people think of the flu as something normal. In, in, in our case, that uh, in Europe, that every winter you get the flu, your uh, vaccination uptake is pretty bad. Um, even if uh, every year the tens of thousands of people who die uh, is kind of, an, kind of accepted in, in society. So that, that's not helpful. And that's one of the reasons I came out, uh, you know, as a patient. Um, to, to tell the story and to say, look, it is not the flu. It is much, much worse. Um, and, and we know already that case fatality rate is higher than the flu. Um, but again, these are pretty abstract for most people. So it's the personal narrative, the story that really um, makes it real, not statistics and so on. So even if I myself, I, I'm a lot driven by you know, quantitative things and figures and so on, get excited about it. But uh, that's pretty exceptional in society, I should say. 
We have a, a question for uh, Kishor, from Kishore uh, Mabubani. Uh, Peter, wouldn't it be logical for US and China to pause their geopolitical contest and work together to fight COVID-19 first? No, I couldn't agree more. I mean, I think what we're seeing is that in the face of uh, crisis and epidemics, uh, I, I've said before that it brings out the worst and the best in people and in societies. Um, you know, and uh, on the positive side is that, for example, that the, um, uh, when we talk about research, since that's Koshi's uh, question about, uh, you know, there's a really um, an enormous uh, collective effort with the sharing of information. Um, I mean, it's hard to keep up and uh, so on. However, um, the current uh, geopolitics, I mean, particularly the China, uh, you know, US, um, antagonism is not very helpful. And um, what we are seeing, for example, when it comes to, uh, to vaccine development and, 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 and access something, a new word that's been launched, uh, uh, vaccine nationalism. And, um, you know, where the Trump administration said, okay, um, vaccines manufacturing in America are for Americans. Uh, if every country does that, um, then the majority of people in the world will be left without a vaccine because there are very few uh, countries that are producing and manufacturing vaccine. The US and China are part of it. And, uh, you know, and this is a kind of what I'm trying to, to do um, uh, at the political level, uh, advising uh, the EU uh, to say, okay, we have to be not only take care of the health of citizens in the EU, but also uh, try to bring the various players together and also, um, you know, emphasize uh, equitable access to, um, you know, to whatever, to drugs, to, uh, to vaccines. So I, I, I agree this, you know, I've seen it when I was um, head of UN AIDS um, at uh, when there also were many complicated um, diplomatic issues and, 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 you know, post Cold War and so on. And yet, just as for our vaccination programs, sometimes you can use health to break down these barriers or at least keep channels open for collaboration. And, you know, there have been armistices, even in Afghanistan, to vaccinate people. But it seems today that we've reached a stage where that's not yet uh, uh, possible. But we have to get there. And I think we will get there um, because um, after the uh, uh, in initial super optimism about what we can produce as a vaccine, maybe even medical hubris, you know, um, when we come back to reality, uh, I think we will all have to work together to, uh, to, to save the world because let's be very clear. And I think that Dale's presentation was uh, really reminding me again, this is a pandemic, meaning it's all over the world. And even an island like, uh, you know, like New Zealand, is not uh, going to be um, secure and sure until the virus is, is gone or under control, let, let's put it that way, um, all over the world. So we'll have to learn how to live with COVID-19 uh, everywhere, but hopefully at very low levels. But um, if we don't collaborate, uh, we're all going to lose. This is a, a, a typical example of that. So who is the who's the policeman? Who's who's there to tell everybody to behave? There is no policeman. And uh, if you think of, uh, for example, uh, WHO, the World Health Organization, um, that's uh, a, a so-called intergovernmental organization, and it uh, you know it, it it can't send the fifth fleet, and I think that's a good thing. Um, it, it is by bringing people together. It's, uh, you know, this may be something that's more for the Security Council, but the Security Council today no longer represents really the, um, uh, how to say, the power relations in the world with, uh, since it is still a product of the, uh, you know, the World War II. And I, uh, I act actually addressed the Security Council several times and uh, including at the first ever session that it held on a non-classical, um, uh, security issue on health and I was on AIDS. That was in January 2000. And um, there was a lot of resistance, but I think that's the only body in the, uh, in the UN where, you know, that decides about war and peace. But even these decisions are not 
uh, you know, are, are not uh, necessarily uh, followed up or, or uh, re enforced or enforceable. So it is really, there's no alternative to, let's say, diplomacy and trying to find a common ground um, and uh, to make sure that it's clear that it's in the interest of every single state, every single nation to work together and that this is not a zero-sum game. Okay, I win, I've got a vaccine and you won't have one because that's going to make the problem even worse for everybody. But just uh, on that one, uh, Peter, I haven't heard you talk about uh, the community as, as being the policeman. I, I, I love it when I see these musicians around the world uh, singing or business leaders giving their companies giving big donations and, and maybe, maybe the policemen aren't governments. Maybe it's, maybe it's, it's the people. Yeah, Adele, I, I really like that. I mean, that was the case uh, for AIDS. It was the same in the beginning. So uh, it's a bit of uh, my, my life has been like that. And, um, but I would say that's the pressure. And uh, um, but at the end of the day, this has to be translated into um, international agreements in uh, policies and so on. But I totally agree with you. Um, and that's where um, I think that that's also a, um, a difficult um, balance sometimes uh, because there's also a driver for fake news for uh, all kinds of things. Like here in Europe, we have a famous tennis player who is also one of the most vocal anti-vaxxers. Um, he got COVID-19 because he organized a tennis tournament in, the, in you know, in his uh, native country, in Croatia, and uh, and it's still time of sending messages that are going against, um, you know, safer behavior for, um, you know, in the times of COVID. So I totally agree with you, and I think that at the end of the day, I've been thinking, uh, again, based on my AIDS experience, that. Um, we probably, with such a pandemic, we need to go for, uh, there will be movements coming up. And not only movements like we see, for example, in the US of people who are against uh, face coverings and so on and, and, and lockdown, but of people who say, okay, this is about our life, this is about the future of our children. You know, what if you're uh, in many countries, you're 18 or 17, you know, at the moment, the job market, the even getting your university degree is kind of a real, big problem. We also will have millions of survivors and uh, some people will uh, also speak up. So really good point. If you can put up the next slide, Joe, and I'll give everybody a chance to read this. This was an editorial uh, you wrote in 2015. It was relevant to Ebola, but you were addressing uh, yourself and your colleagues from Harvard. Um, we're addressing uh, some of the issues as far as the global response to Ebola. Um, and there were 10 essential reforms that you uh, spoke of here. Uh, were, were these recommendations acted on? Why did you feel like they needed to be made? Well, um, yeah, this was uh, the first of a, a small outbreak of um, um, reviews and panels uh, analyzing the response to the West Africa Ebola outbreak, where um, both the, the national response and the responses. It, it was affecting heavily three countries in West Africa, Guinea, uh, Liberia, and Sierra Leone. And uh, also the international response was really late and inadequate in the beginning. And it resulted in over 11,000 deaths uh, from Ebola, which was the biggest ever. When you put it in perspective of COVID, yeah, that's uh, not so what. But these three countries were completely destabilized. And so we're trying to make use of uh, uh, the crisis and uh, the failures to see how can we do better because there will be new outbreaks. And um, so we had this, this was a, an independent commission with the Harvard uh, Global Health Institute and the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine that I co-chaired with Ashid uh, uh, Ja. And um, the, the recommendations were not followed, that's for sure for most of them, but. So I, I would say some things have gotten better. I, I would say that uh, whereas uh, WHO was a complete fiasco in 2014-15 uh, uh, in, in, in West Africa, I think it's done much better um, in uh, subsequent Ebola outbreaks like in, uh, in Congo. And by the way, the one that was um, this week 
was officially ended. Uh, Could I mean, you put up the next slide, Joe? I'm sorry, why you're, why go ahead, Peter, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt, but put up the next slide. And, uh, I think that the, uh, we have a, a chapter on, on, on set on um, R&D and uh, the, um, the um, um, CEPI was, uh, was created uh, and what, for what to do what, so the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovation, because what we said, um, there is a, um, where well, there is no market incentive, why would companies invest hundreds of millions to develop a vaccine? We were very lucky with Ebola that uh, Merck, uh, Merck Sharp and Dome and Johnson and Johnson uh, invested hundreds of millions to develop a vaccine. And by the way, yesterday, the European Medicines Agency um, uh, really approved formally uh, the J&J &J vaccine for Ebola. So, so we have now two. So that's why we said we need a mechanism uh, to fund, um, you know, uh, the development of vaccines uh, with this market failure. And, uh, and then came uh, COVID and that uh, already in, in January, I was at the World Economic Forum in Davos in uh, uh, must be the week of the 20th of, uh, of January. Uh, CEPI issued the first four contracts uh, uh, for, to develop a vaccine, so for COVID-19. So we have a mechanism. But I think on the rest, there was not much uh, progress. For example, the international health regulations are really important. Uh, it's a treaty. Uh, it's legally binding in theory. But there are some problems with it. One, the committee that's managing it is far too slow and risk averse. And sometimes WHO is blamed for what actually this re committee uh, recommends. And, and also it's an all or nothing uh, thing, you know, either uh, you have no problem or it's a, uh, you know, an, an epidemic of public health uh, uh, importance, a, a, a fake as it's called. Um, it's like if you can say, okay, there's a hurricane or a typhoon and it's either uh, absolutely the worst you can think of or there is no problem. It's a little bit of wind. No, you need a, a spectrum, that's what we recommended. And, uh, you know, with maybe a grading from one to five or whatever um, for, for epidemics. And, uh, um, and then what I think where is the biggest failure is the lack of many countries to invest in preparedness. Um, you know, one of the things I've learned in my life dealing with epidemics is that uh, two things. One is that if you're prepared, if you have systems in place, then you can act early and acting early is so important. That's why the title of my memoir is No Time to Lose. Uh, because when something is contagious, the sooner you can uh, interfere and stop the transmission, uh, the more cases, subsequent cases, you're gonna um, you know, prevent. So I think that um, it, it, there's some progress, but not enough. And um, we, I hope that uh, this pandemic will really um, lead to um, you know, some serious, serious investments to prepare for the next pandemic, but also for the next waves, for the outbreaks and so on, because as I said before, it's absolutely not over yet. Um, and, and we'll have to, uh, to learn while we're sailing or while we're racing is a better term, I think. I'm just wondering what motivations exist for the, 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 the entities that have the capacity to prepare for the next uh, pandemic to do so. I mean, it may sound like a naive, naive question, but I'm just, I'm, I'm wondering what lessons will be learned from COVID uh, that will will fundamentally change our, our approach to things. Well, it's the eternal problem of prevention, uh, not only for epidemics, but be it diabetes. I mean, Singapore, you've got the war on diabetes, and uh, I mean, and and that's. Uh, in, in general, in societies, we're waiting until people are diabetics and with all the serious problems. Now we have to invest as an individual and as society way before. But I think, um, being an optimist in general, that um, if, if COVID, the COVID pandemic, is not uh, sending the signal that we've got to be better prepared, that we've got to invest in uh, public health systems, uh, you know, in, in early diagnostics, uh, uh, what have you. Um, you know, uh, I don't know what more it would take because the uh, economic cost, in addition to the death toll and in addition to the toll on people's um, lives, uh, even mental health and well-being is so enormous 
and uh, is going to be pretty long lasting, um, that this should be not just a wake up call, but a, an indication that without investing uh, in preparedness, um, we are really, uh, you know, the next epidemic may be even worse. Um, and uh, so in, in, for example, in Europe, in the EU, uh, for the first time now, um, dealing with epidemics is going uh, to be an, an, an issue for the uh, European Union as a whole. Up to now, this was dealt with on a case by case basis by each country, which ultimately they have to act in, in their own community. But um, it is really in terms of, um, um, you know, uh, it's a global good for, yeah, saving the world globally. Dale? Yeah, thanks. I've got a, I'm looking through the, the question list. I'm, I'm trying to answer a few that are relevant to me, but I've got a couple from, uh, from colleagues in Australia, medical colleagues in Australia that uh, I'll get into trouble if I don't, uh, don't get asked. Um, <laughs> one's from Genevieve Gabb and she's, uh, she's uh, got a question which represents a number of the questions, Peter, and it's about you. Um, how are you feeling? Uh, long-term sequelae, how long did you take to get better? There's probably a dozen questions from people uh, asking about your personal health, if you wanted to share. Uh, and, and a second question is from uh, Damon Eisen. He says, I know that you'll discuss vaccine development, but it's obvious great work's being done. I found it unhelpful that early on many groups broadcast that they were optimistic that a vaccine could be available in 12 to 16 weeks. So these there's been a lot of crazy predictions uh, also from uh, drugs, um, just the, the sort of premature enthusiasm. Uh, is, is that uh, particularly unhelpful? So two questions there, thanks. Okay, thanks Dale, thanks for the question. Well, on the personal front, well, just I'll start. I went jogging this morning, so that's uh, something that even two weeks ago I would have been unable to do. And so it's been, I was diagnosed the 19th of, uh, March. I mean, not the, yeah. I, that, that's when it started. Uh, getting a diagnosis in a, a, a lab test in the UK then was extremely difficult. Uh, you know, I, that's you know, there's the NHS, but I had to go into a private clinic to um, have a PCR test, uh, which was positive. But uh, um, the, the surprise for me and the frustrating part was how long it took. I mean, I thought after I'd left the hospital and where you know, thank God, I only needed oxygen. Uh, and bacterial pneumonia, and I got also anticoagulant uh, therapy, which uh, retrospectively was probably extremely uh, important. But that, um, I, I thought, okay, I'm still very uh, tired, but now I just have to rest and that's it. But then I developed this, what's called here, organizing pneumonia and interstitial pneumonia type. And, uh, and that took a long time. It's only then that I became short of breath. I never had short of breath, even if my oxygen saturation was like close to 80, um, you know, and I could go or walk around and uh, I live in an old house in London and could go up and down the stairs without any problem. And I had no under underlying disease and the only drug to take was statins like many of my age. Um, so uh, it, it's this chronic uh, slow, slow recovery that I found very frustrating. And the doctor said, patients, and rest. No, these are not my greatest qualities. <laughs> and uh, so I, you know, but now I'm, I'm, I'm over it. And uh, I, I, yeah, I had also atrial fibrillation and so on. So also some cardiac problems, but all that seems to be okay. Um, and um, okay, let's see. I, I uh, probably a bit of fibrosis in the lungs and so on, but uh, not enough to, you know, you can live with that. But there are other people who are on renal dialysis and so on. So in other words, it's uh, at the hospital now, I'm, I'm at UCLH, uh, University College London Hospital, where really world-class uh, care. Um, but they say that I'm a fast recoverer, whereas I find that I'm a very slow one. So, but, <laughs> so um, yeah, I, um, the question on vaccines is one that goes, um, I share that concern enormously. Um, there are, in general, I don't believe in miracles. Um, and uh, so promising uh, a vaccine for hundreds of millions of people by September or October now, in other words, that's uh, in three months time, two months and, and a half, let's say, um, to me seems so unlikely. Um, first of all, when you take the development of vaccines, 
um, the success rate in general uh, is far less than 10% between, you know, the beginning of uh, well, the lab tester, let's say that the mice and the non-human primates and bring a product to the market. Um, and, you know, you can't take shortcuts on two things. One is um, efficacy. You need to demonstrate that uh, it protects. Um, and, uh, uh, and that takes time. That requires randomized controlled trials in a population with an incidence of uh, new infections uh, that uh, is high enough to come to meaningful conclusions. Um, and that, that, is, uh, that takes time. Um, and, uh, uh, and secondly, and then the, 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 another question that is not being discussed enough, I find, is that will this vaccine sterilize? In other words, will it um, prevent acquisition of the virus, so transmission interruption, or is it only going to um, you know, prevent uh, severe disease and, uh, and death? I mean, which would be great. But when you look at the track record of respiratory of vaccines against respiratory infections, um, you know, take influenza and so on, and I know it's a very different virus, but we can anticipate it may be more of preventing, uh, you know, mortality and severity of disease. And, uh, and will it be as effective in elderly people? Because that's where often the um, effectiveness uh, of uh, vaccines is lower if you're over 80 or so, even 70. So that's the first point. And the second point, equally important, is safety. You know, this is a vaccine that probably will be needed by billions of people. We're not talking about millions, but billions. And uh, so we need to make sure that we are injecting absolutely safe uh, biological material in these people, in, uh, in all of us. Um, and again, that takes time. So that's one thing. So I, I share the, uh, you know, the, the bit of the anxiety of... Uh, uh, you know, of uh, management uh, of expectations. It's also a bit of a, hmm, when you hear some people, uh, some uh, politicians or public health figures say, okay, we need to do all this, and then next year we'll have a vaccine and we'll go back to normal. I think forget it. It's going to be a vaccine. It's not going to be the silver bullet. If we have a 70% effective uh, vaccine, I think that's, uh, I would consider that a, a big success. And so we'll probably have to go to what we call in HIV combination prevention. We will have to continue to do certain things of social distancing, masks, and all that. Um, and some of it is probably driven by stock market uh, interests and, uh, and so on. And then sometimes, you know, uh, we scientists, we uh, can also sometimes be a bit overenthusiastic. You know, the classic example is I find a new gene in for cancer X, and uh, we have a treatment for that cancer. Um, so, um, no, it, it, it is, I think I'm very worried about all that, particularly if something goes wrong, which is nearly uh, certainly going to happen, uh, going wrong in the sense that it, um, you know, it won't protect as much as we feel, or it fails, or it's a side effect X or Y or Z. And there is already a lot of uh, anti-vaccine sentiment in many countries, and that could uh, really uh, make things worse. So um, I, I, I would say we should all work together to, to have a soft landing of these expectations and, and hope that we are um, under promise and over deliver. That would be the best. And not that but we have the, uh, run the risk now of going into the other way around. If uh, Joe, you, you can put up the next slide. And this, uh, we're talking about R and D today. And I apologize for the busyness of the slide. And you don't need to necessarily read it, but this is from the Economist. And the uh, names on the left are people who have, or countries, or entities that have donated money. The entities in the middle are those that are collecting that money and then disperse it, dispersing it, uh, which is off to the right, where you can see whether it's for preparedness or for. Um, uh, uh, R&D, et cetera. So I, I guess the question is, there's an enormous amount of money. You can see here there's $7.8 billion pledged. Um, is this the way to coordinate uh, our, our best efforts? Is this the way to have equitable uh, uh, access? Is this the way to, does this dilute out uh, our expertise by having so much money dispersed over so many different uh, uh, places? 
a few reflections on that. one the, there's even more money than this this is okay. uh, I, I've seen this and even the uh, the pledging for um, the uh, act accelerator the anti um, COVID tools accelerator um, is uh, you know has raised over 10 million billion but anyway it's it sounds a lot of money but it's not enough also because it includes R&D and uh, then later on manufacturing and uh, uh, and delivery. So uh, my view is that as far as the R&D is concerned that pluralism, let's go that way, is probably a very good thing in this case because the uncertainties are enormous and um, we really don't know um, for sure what's going to work, what's not going to work. Um, although uh, when we look at um, you know, uh, reports that there are, I don't know, 150 or more uh, vaccine candidates in development. I don't take that, that too seriously uh, because at the end of the day, uh, we're probably talking about maybe 10, maybe 20 um, that have a serious chance of, of making it to, to the people, to the market. Um, so I have no problem with the pluralism um, as long as it's, um, how to say, there is some fair distribution of, a, of opportunities for researchers in wherever you are to, to bring the best. Uh, we need the brightest people to deal with this and the best groups. When it comes to, um, I think there's a, there's a need for better coordination. And going back to the first question, uh, you know, uh, this is where uh, when you look at these efforts, you can, actually there are three blocks in the world. I mean, there is the US and there's China and then there's the rest. Uh, you know, in terms of uh, um, research, R&D coordination and investment is the, uh, the warp speed uh, efforts in the US, there's China, uh, I'm not sure exactly how it's organized, um, and then the rest. And so uh, that's where I think we need much better coordination. And, uh, but what does coordination mean? I mean, in the first place, it means, um, you know, exchange of information and in real time. And, uh, but what I'm more interested in, in, in essence now at this stage is, um, is access and is manufacturing. Just imagine, this has never been done. Um, we will need, let's say five billion, between three and five billion uh, doses of, uh, of one or more vaccines, probably a few vaccines, three, four vaccines. Um, and making sure that 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 manufacturing capacity is not there at the moment. Even the number of glass vials, billions of glass vials to put the vaccine in, it's not there. So that is where, uh, you know, um, if everybody's going to do it on their own, uh, that, that may be counterproductive and we may not get in there. And that's why it's important also that, let's say, Big Pharma, the big producers of uh, vaccines are involved in this because we will need their type of expertise, but also we need the know-how and the innovation from the smaller, the biotechs from the universities. So how to bring that system together. But then there is the access and who will have access to it. Um, and um, uh, this is where um, I've, I've been working on together with our colleagues from CEPI, the, uh, from the uh, from the EU, some of WHO, and, um, and, and I really welcome very much an, an, a Singapore-led initiative of the Friends of COVAX. This is a, uh, an initiative uh, to make sure that countries that are neither big vaccine manufacturers or the big powers or, you know, the low-income countries, the African countries, how can they get access also? And uh, uh, this is what we're working on so that there is a kind of um, some kind of allocation and distribution of the vaccines. The big unknown, of course, is which vaccine is going to make it. And that's a, a nightmare for companies. So you can't afford to wait to set up and um, to uh, your manufacturing capacity uh, until you know whether your vaccine is safe and effective, because it takes easily a year uh, to commission a, certainly if it's a completely new building or, or, or six months to a year to, um, yeah, to commission and, and, and make sure that a, uh, an entity, a manufacturing entity meets all the criteria, the draconian criteria for vaccine manufacturing. And that, um, 
is something that means that they're starting to in, to, uh, to invest in that and to uh, you know and to equip and so on, and it could all be for nothing, and that means that three four hundred million U.S. dollars down the drains, and uh, and that's why um, you know the, the 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 public sector countries have to come in to de-risk, uh, but at the condition that the deal is that there is access. So, but not only access for, um, you know, the high income countries and the manufacturers, the countries that are manufacturing, but uh, in a broader context. And I think that's gonna be one of the big um, uh, political, geopolitical issues in the future. Um, you know, uh, how, uh, which nations are gonna have access to essential uh, vaccines and medicines. You know, we had the, um, uh, this week, I, I, uh, it was announced that, you know, the, the Gilead drug, Remdesivir, um, you know, which is the only antiviral that's shown to have some uh, effect on uh, uh, COVID-19 uh, or on the infection, um, on the disease uh, progression, uh, that the U.S. government has uh, basically has bought nearly the whole stock meaning that the rest of the world will not have access to, um, to that drug. Okay, there are agreements with some generic manufacturers in, uh, in India to produce uh, it and so on, but this is a really the worst as possible scenario. And that's the kind of scenario we need to avoid when it comes to vaccines as well. Peter, we could go all night uh, and I would love to do so, but unfortunately our, uh, our sponsors won't let us do that. So we're going to, uh, quickly switch over to Dale uh, for uh, his, his update. Thanks everyone. I, I hope you can hang on for another five or 10 minutes. I've got some, uh, some nice things to talk about this week. Um, so I'll start with an apology, then now what? And then MSF. So uh, I showed this slide last week and, and I think as I spoke, I implied that this sort of the, the anti-racist marching were responsible for this uptick in the USA. And uh, being uh, responsive as we are, um, we got some feedback. Thank you, great sessions. One minor point, some of the precipitous rise in states like Arizona and Florida have not been attributed to racial activism, but rather to lax lockdown regulations due to political affiliations and early openings. So uh, I take that completely on board. My intention was not to say that was the only reason. Um, Obviously, the, the, the lockdowns um, being undone too early and, and various other reasons were responsible for, what, for what's happening. So, so thanks, uh, Tracy Dunbrook, for keeping us, on, uh, keeping us honest. Uh, and just by, since I've got an epi curve, just to show you what's happened since it continues to climb up. So um, lots of problems in the US. Um, my next one is, is now what? Um, I just want to, I mentioned earlier about what zero cases mean, and this is a, another WHO slide, as most of mine, or many of mine are. Um, th these are countries in this table that have never had, uh, had uh, COVID-19 cases, and these are the ones that have had, had not had it for at, at least one incubation period. And I've just highlighted ones that I'm sure there's more, but I know these, these uh, states rely on tourism. And I don't know how they can survive. We're talking these lovely uh, Pacific Islands, Tonga, Vanuatu, Fiji, uh, Caribbean Islands, uh, Europe. Um, it's, uh, so that's, that's my first point is once you've got zero and you've got this expectation, how do you then unlock borders with a community expectation that you're a zero country? And it must be crippling their economies. So now let's go to Australia and New Zealand. I mentioned earlier about Australia. These states of Australia, states and territories, have not had COVID for these number of days, okay? So, so we're talking 60 days in the Northern Territory. There, there's some imported cases that go straight into quarantine and, and may end up diagnosed. But uh, Tasmania, the Australian Capital Territory, uh, Queensland, South Australia, Western Australia are, are all looking at zero cases. We know Victoria's got some problems and New South Wales got, got some small circulation. But uh, what is the plan? If you get to zero, sure, it, it, it might be great. You can have your crowds back, New Zealand. You can see all the, 
the district health boards are sitting on zero and here's the New Zealand epi curve, which peaked at 90 cases a day and now just has a handful of imported cases that must go into quarantine. You, you can't open your society while everyone coming in has to sit in two weeks of quarantine. And my argument is that you've, you've set the, firstly, congratulations on eradicating it, but, but this is where I say, what next? Because, because I, don't, uh, I don't believe it's sustainable. Um, it's, it's a double-edged sword. You've set the community expectation too high and you're not living with it. The best way, the best thing to do, and actually I applaud what's happening in Victoria at the moment, they're showing they can live with it. They're, they're doing massive testing, um, engaging the community, um, everything's ramped up, hundreds of thousands of cases, many, many contact tracers out there trying to find, find people. Um, they're enforcing public health laws. Um, so, so I don't think zero is a good number. I think a, a small number that, that keeps you at about an R naught of one, where you can shut down clusters, you can ramp up your response, you've got an agile leadership, your, your community is, is trusting and responsive, and to me, I think that's, uh, that, that's the perfect way to do it. Um, and, and likewise, opening the borders. If, if you're working with a country, it doesn't really matter the number of cases. If you're working with a country and they know where all the cases are, they know where all the contacts are, then, then that should be good enough because contacts can't travel. Well, they shouldn't travel. They should be in, in some sort of quarantine. So, so they're not going to be the ones crossing borders. So you can be, you, you can take a small risk and allow borders to be open and, and you can have trust in your own system that if you do find a case that, uh, and a cluster occurs, then you'll shut it down. Um, so I think it is naive to say, let's just sit on zero until a vaccine comes. Vaccine may not come at all, may not come soon. Uh, it's very unlikely to be 100% effective. No way is everybody going to take it. So, so eventually you're going to have to open your borders and you're going to have, a country is going to have to be good at these public health activities. So that's my, my point with just trying to be a little bit thought provoking on, on how low do you want your number of cases to be. And I think zero is too low. Um, so let's talk about Medicine Sans Frontier. Um, and I'm doing this, Peter, because uh, as, you, as you pointed out um, last week, the, uh, the, the Ebola outbreak in North Kivu was, was declared over, of course, replaced by another in Equator, but uh, let's not, not spoil the party. Uh, and talk about MSF, because they're really a, an outstanding organization. Um, you may know them as Doctors Without Borders, they're a very strong uh, Goan partner. They support authorities um, to provide care for COVID-19 patients. They put extra effort into protecting those who are vulnerable uh, and are at risk. And, uh, and, and also efforts on to keeping essential medical services running, perhaps extra treatment centers while the COVID response is happening. And here's just some pictures that, that, I, that I found. They, they uh, work in over 70 countries around the world. Here's some, some uh, swabbing centers and triage centers in, in Sao Paulo. Um, this is uh, in, in Africa, uh, uh, a, a makeshift hospital that, that they've built. Um, you can see sometimes they have to do it, uh, help, help out when, when COVID-19 coincides with a natural disaster. Again, more medical centers, um, Yemen, uh, what, what, what a extraordinarily difficult place it must be to, to protect people in, in, in refugee type settings. Uh, mental health, they're, they're actively involved with, um, here's the caption, escaping first Libya and now coronavirus in Germany. But it, it's, it's all settings. Here they are in, in London where this is a, a, a care center for, for homeless people. So um, this is, um, a sort of a one-page summary of the outbreak. It, uh, it, it was declared over last, last, uh, last week. It was, uh, began in July 2018. There's been three and a half thousand cases and, and clearly in, in that time frame, 
I think this is a relatively small number, which you'd have to give a fair bit of credit to, to the, to the vaccine. Um, never really reaching more than about 100 cases a day. Uh, two thirds uh, death rate, 5% uh, of those uh, infected were, were healthcare workers. Um, there's, uh, there was this little resurgence uh, at the end here. We, we, we almost got through to declaring it over uh, and then there were seven more cases, but that was the, 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 the final thing. They're staying on for another 90 days. That was at least, that was always the promise because to engage the community, there was a strong belief by the community as soon as the Ebola outbreak was over, everyone would pack up and, and go. So that promise was made and it's being adhered to that they're gonna, they're gonna stay and, and improve the, the health systems overall. Here's a nice graphic I received from, uh, from WHO um, uh, today. Um, it, it'll show it's, uh, it's in time and geography, and I hope this works, but uh, you can see the date up the top right-hand corner uh, of, of cases as they appear, and, and the extent, this is, uh, here's the, the graph here, it's 160 kilometers. So from the southernmost one to the northernmost one is probably about 500 kilometers. So, and, and you can just see how it, uh, how it spread over time and, and geographically. So, um, so this is uh, what the playbook looks like now. It's really extraordinary. And, uh, and uh, I'm sure Peter, you must love this considering your, your, your early days of working in, uh, in Ebola outbreaks. It would have been a, a dream to, to have something like this, but you can see that over 300,000 contacts and contacts of contacts were vaccinated. Um, the, uh, the GoData, which is a, a, a software that, uh, that, that maintains data and contact tracing and can actually come up with a, with a transmission tree during it. It's uh, very, very useful. And that's been taken up by about 40 countries during, during this response, but uh, was particularly, uh, uh, I guess, highlighted here. Um, various diagnostics, gene expert, which many people will be familiar with, um, you know, really being able to get a test from many different mobile sites um, within hours um, and, and over 220,000 samples were tested. Um, these pods, which have just, just come out, it's, uh, people have been very reluctant to, to offer hands-on treatment to uh, Ebola patients in, in Ebola treatment centres. But, but now it's, it's possible to, uh, to, to take OBS and, and take blood and things like that. So uh, put drips in. Um, so this alleviates a lot of fears and hopefully should bring, bring down um, uh, uh, death rates going forward and, and healthcare worker infections. Um, tremendous amount of community engagement gone on. 2,100 community engagement teams. Uh, this was obviously very challenging in... Uh, in North Kivu because of the uh, insecurity there. So, so being able to engage the, the community, you remember MSF actually uh, were, were victims of, of attacks. Um, and of course there's, there's, diagnos uh, there's therapeutic trials going on. So, so many hundreds uh, enrolled in, in clinical trials for, for EVD. So as I say, um, it was declared over. Um, I've got a nice uh, video. Um, which uh, I, I just loved when I saw it. It only goes for 30 seconds, but it's, uh, you know, I always look for a, a happy ending at the, uh, at, at the end of these, these webinars. So, uh, so Joe, if you could play it for me. Yeah, let's hope uh, it's not too long until we're, we're doing something like that about COVID. Uh, that's all from me this week, and thanks to everyone for staying on. Back to you, David. Great, Dale. Uh, and I look forward to the video of you uh, dancing in celebration. <laughs>
Um, <laughs> you don't want to some, say that. Okay. <laughs> uh, just some quick points, uh, some notes I took uh, this evening. Um, pandemics generally don't uh, respect political arrogance or economic imperatives. Uh, apolitical na uh, multinational initiatives have a greater chance of leading us forward compared to nationalistic endeavors. Research and development requires balancing the existential needs for discoveries with profit, liability, and geopolitical no uh, motives. It now leads me uh, to thank uh, Peter uh, for his uh, thoughtful responses to our questions and taking uh, extra time with us uh, on a very busy day to be with us, and we're, we're so very grateful. So thank you, Peter. Um, Next week's speaker is uh, Dr. Cornelia Chi. She's head and senior consultant at Department of Psychological Medicine, National University Hospital, and senior consultant, director of Women's Emotional Health Services, as well as head and clinical senior lecturer, Department of Psychological Medicine, Yong Lu Lin a School of Medicine at National University of Singapore. The title of her talk will be Mental Health Issues Surrounding COVID-19. There's a chat box at the bottom of your screen. We would appreciate your feedback. The chat box will be open for another 10 minutes. Please give us your comments. It helps us to make this so much better. Until next week, stay safe and wash your hands. I know you'll find much needed humor in the reworking of David Bowie's classic song, Let's Dance, by the English funk group Jamiroquai into their updated version by the name of Lockdown. Enjoy. Good night.